Welcome back into the film room. I'm your host, Eric Turner. As always, joined by my co-host, Anthony Prohaska from Disguise Coverage. Ant, what's going on, brother? There's a lot going on for the Buffalo Bills right now. We got we're, we're getting into draft season and draft prep time, and that's already busy. We're still processing the 13 seconds and the playoff loss, so that's always bu- also busy in our brains. But now, I'm sorry, but now we've got all this these coaching staff changes. Somewhat uncharted territory for us as Bills fans now to see like the Bills be the team that other teams are poaching from and taking from, and the Bills now have to replenish from within and from the outside. And so we've got several new and important offensive staff changes on offense and. Our heads are spinning in an excited way, and there's a lot going on, but I'm excited for it. Yeah, no, appreciate it, man. And yeah, you're right. You know, this is uh, unprecedented territory. Obviously, the Bills eliminated, but also a lot of, you know, coaching changes. And I almost refer to this phase of, uh, you know, McDermott's regime, Bean's regime, but really Josh Allen's regime. It's phase two. You know, you got Mm -hmm. your franchise quarterback. Now it's sustaining that success. Um, So I call this like phase two for Josh Allen phase two of the bills. And again, we're joined this week uh, as like last weekend, uh, we did some senior bowl recap stuff, some film room stuff. We're joined again by Kendall. Kendall, what's going on, brother? Boo. Oh man, <laughs> come on. <laughs> no, I'm doing good. Uh, yeah, it's exciting to talk about these coaches. Cause like you said, yeah, it really is phase two. It's so much about the sustainability aspect of it all, because mm-hmm. you know, once Bean and McDermott got to town, it was really about, you know, stripping it to the studs, building it up to what it is right now. But really, what does it mean if it can't be sustained past this point? And it is so mm-hmm. interesting just to po- juxtaposing it with what it used to be, where it was like, oh, these coaches, man, the grass has got to be greener. It, can, it can't get any worse than this. Mm-hmm. And it's just constantly moving on from one to the next. And now it's like, oh, we actually have a good coaching staff. It's tough to retain them. And now we right. got to find the next guy to keep this thing rolling. So, yeah, very, very interested to see what the new coaches can do. And then obviously learn a couple of things from you guys about these these couple of coaches that we brought in, because I'm not much of a coaching head. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> but it is in, it is interesting to me. Mm. Now, you talked about, you know, juxta, juxtapose, uh, juxtapose. OK, I'll forget that word. <laughs> Juxtaposing. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, and, you know, it's exactly what's uh, going to happen tonight, because, you know, as Kendall just said, we are bringing back an offensive line coach and Aaron Cromer. And so you yeah. saw me post a bunch of film of him and that 2015, 2016 run game. And that kind of brought me back and got me excited, obviously. And, you know, thinking about the bills, you know, fastball passing offense mixed with the uh, power type running game that Cromer mm-hmm. can bring the multiple run game that uh, he can bring. And then of course, yes, Ken Dorsey, obviously getting promoted to offensive coordinator the Bills bring in on Joe Brady, uh, obviously, as the quarterback's coach to replace uh, Ken Dorsey. So we have some uh, f- a few coaching uh, film room type stuff. We're going to do, um, obviously, some play breakdowns. Uh, we're going to take a look at some, uh, which is going to be really cool. We're going to take a look at some clinics. Uh, we're going to take a look at a couple of clinics from um, Joe Moorhead, who taught Joe Brady pretty much all he knew about RPOs. We're going to see some clinics from uh, Aaron Cromer. Uh, back in 2016 with the Bills. So you'll actually see some footage of Cromer teaching his system to guys like Eric Wood, Cyrus Quanjo, uh, John mm-hmm. Miller. So that's Legends. that's going to be some, some fun stuff uh, to, to go through. So that's what we have on the docket for today. Uh, we appreciate everyone tuning in. Let us know where you're you know tuning in from. Uh, you know, and we like that roll call. Uh, make sure to leave a comment in, in, in the chat box that, so we can bring it up and, and engage with you guys as we go forward. Uh, we're going to try to keep this a little light. We're not going to get too in-depth into the weeds, into the X's and O's. I say that. But I was going to say fast forward to when we're still here at like 10.30. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So uh, with that said, let's get this under. Let's get this started here. Uh, everything starts with a quarterback. As I said, this is phase two for Josh Allen. And, you know, there were a lot of candidates, I'm sure, that the Bills brought in and that a lot of fans were – uh, you know, mm. conjuring up thoughts of, hey, this guy with Josh Allen, like imagine the offense and how well they could, you know, really execute. Um, but I really think that by hiring Ken Dorsey, Joe Brady and Cromer really was like the closest route the Bills could have gone to keep in continuity. Obviously, Dorsey is going to keep most of the system intact. 
And he's probably going to add a, a couple different wrinkles, his own little, you know, spice to the offense now that he can call the plays and game plan and scheme things. But I think overall, you know, bring in a guy like Brady is a guy that, you know, obviously has been a few different places known as the wonder kid. And we're going to show you why that is. Um, he come from a heavy RPO type system, uh, you know, in, at Penn state with Moorhead, which we'll talk about. And then of course, you know, Cromer again, familiarity, right. And he's a multiple, um, run game type of guy. He has, has a lot of experience, which is really, really important for Ken Dorsey and even Joe Brady for that matter. Right, Anthony. Yeah. I, I, we, we talked about it offline before we, we went live tonight. The, the continuity piece, I think a lot of people have talked about it the last several years in terms of like continuity from an actual people perspective, like running it back with the same personnel or the same coaching staff. And you get a piece of that with Ken Dorsey, but there's also continuity from the sake of people who might be different than, you know, the people who had their position before, but they represent continuity from a scheme or a philosophical or an ideology perspective. And that's what the bills have, what they've done here. And I think that ties in perfectly with, you know, what Kendall said in this lead. And when he talked about the sustainability going forward, right? Because I think it's completely fair for any Bills fan to wonder like, okay, Dable's gone now. Like, what does Josh Allen look like? What does this offense look like? The same way that Giants fans are wondering like, okay, what does Brian Dable and this offense look like without Josh Allen? Like you have questions on both sides. What's Mm -hmm. nice for the Bills is Dable's gone. Shea Tierney is gone. But with Dorsey and then Brady, you've got this continuity piece from a an operations perspective in terms of that spread attack on offense, in terms of the RPO game. You've got people who are familiar with that, who are going to know how to tinker and tweak and continue what's working, but also push the needle a little further. And I think that's a really exciting piece. And to, you know, to, to end it with what you mentioned at the end there, Eric, like it also makes it a nice adjustable piece for Joe Brady, like to come into a team where, you know, especially – how he left Carolina where all the reports were him and Matt rule are clashing and butting heads over, you know, philosophical differences on how they want to run the offenses. And with Brady as the OC and rule as the head coach, Brady might not have to worry about that as much here because he's stepping into a, a system that operates very much what he's used to and how he's used to and wants to build on that component. So I think it's a nice, easy fit in for him and a nice, easy fit in um, for the rest of the puzzle pieces that already existed for the Bills offense. Yeah, Kendall, you know, a few weeks ago, Josh Allen was asked about, you know, the different changes that could happen uh, to his to the staff. And he says, I think when he and he is referring to Ken Dorsey got here three years ago, my career definitely changed in terms of how I viewed the game of football. And Mm -hmm. obviously, um, you know, that was very telling. That was him putting Mm -hmm. his neck on the line for Ken Dorsey saying, hey, we got a, you know, I got a guy in the building that can easily translate and transition. Uh, to coordinator. He knows the system. He's been here for, you know, several years now. Um, And Ken Dorsey, obviously he got the job. So uh, why don't you fill everyone in that maybe aren't familiar with, you know, Dorsey's coaching experience over the last few years. Yeah. So that's the really, the key point to all of this. I think the biggest thing is the fact that Josh Allen wanted this guy. And I think a lot of us gathered that from his uh, end of season Uh, press conference and that was the big selling point to why we all wanted Ken Dorsey uh, on top of the continuity piece but he obviously Miami collegiate quarterback one of the winningest quarterbacks in college football 38 Mm -hmm. and two great player in college struggled in the pros uh, eventually got into coaching in 2013 and he actually started as a pro scout for the Panthers which I found to be interesting but then he transitioned to quarterback coach in 2013 and obviously we all know what happened in carolina with cam newton uh obviously Mm. propels them to a super bowl run and an mvp season from cam newton and cam really gave a lot of credit to ken dorsey along the way in different interviews whatever he's really talked about how impactful ken dorsey has been on his career and then obviously there was that you know downturn in carolina and most of the staff was fired, not necessarily Ken Dorsey's fault, but, you know, he was part of that staff. Right. And then a weird little blip in his resume where he goes and <laughs> takes an administrative role at Florida <laughs> International University. A lot of us are a little shocked by that. It's a little <laughs> sketchy, but he found his way back to the NFL and obviously finds himself back in Buffalo in a similar role with that uh, QB coach job and with 
somewhat of a similar quarterback in Josh Allen in some ways, the the skill set of prime Cam Newton to what we now know as Josh Allen. It, it There are a lot of translatable skills there. And uh, I think a big part of this too, the comfortability between Ken Dorsey and Josh is the ability that Josh had to take his off-season workouts with Jordan Palmer and mm. work on all of those things in the off-season and then those translating and transitioning to the in-season work with Ken Dorsey and kind of the, the cohesion that all three of those guys had together to work together and work on the mechanics and everything they needed to do and then translate it into the scheme of the offense. I think that's a huge thing. And then obviously getting promoted to passing game coordinator um, this past year is definitely a big feather in the cap for uh, confidence for all of us Bills fans, knowing that he did have a hand in this offense in this passing game, whether we knew it or not, you know, he still had that title and he still had some working responsibility in the passing game. Hmm. Yeah, what's what's hilarious to me, Anthony, is, you know, uh, last couple of days and I showed you guys clips and I posted on Twitter. Um, I went back and watched some of that 2015 offense of the Panthers, mm-hmm. Cam Newton. And, you know, obviously uh, uh, Dorsey was there as a QB coach. And, you know, I found some plays. and I'm like, hold on. The Bills ran that, mm-hmm. you know, those those like uh, pop passes, uh, play action type passes where Josh is mm-hmm. rolling out, makes it looks like he's going to run, but he pops it over the top to Knox or Davis, like the, the Panthers ran that. That was like part of their base offense. I'm like, huh, huh. Dorsey was the, our passing coordinator this, this past year. And huh. coincidentally, they ran that in 2015 to, huh. you, know, mm-hmm. you know, Greg Olson. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. interesting. So I feel that we're going to see, you know, once the season starts and then the bullets start flying, we're going to see uh, how much of Brian Dable's offense may have been, you know, Dorsey's hand. And, and and how often he runs at the frequency and the way they run it. We're going to see some of those techniques and some of those routes. You're going to be like, oh, okay, maybe this is more of a Dorsey call or scheme or game plan. Because, again, this has really been Dorsey's kind of MO when he was coming up through the ranks. Uh, and Even when he was hired to be an assistant um, at App State on Eli Drinkwitz's staff, it was more of like a, a, a analyst coordinator type position, um, game plan type position. So with that said, Kendall's right. You know, the uh, working relationship between the QB coach, Josh Allen, uh, obviously Allen is such a raw prospect and a lot Mm -hmm. of the credit, much like Cam Newton said to his career, Josh Allen owes Dorsey and probably why he, you know, put his neck on the line uh, Mm -hmm. for and vouched for Dorsey. Um, But that relationship is almost like I always kind of equate it to being like in like an office setting where like he's your cubicle partner. Like you're always with him, like, I, you know, I'm mm-hmm. in law enforcement. I, I have, you know, my dog is my partner, but, you know, a lot of us have partners <laughs> like you. There's a certain rapport, way of communicating, uh, way of keeping things light, way of being serious. Like you get to know each other a lot more when you're with each other every single day. And it's like that with position coaches. And I'm sure Josh Allen and Dorsey had that relationship. And I think that can go a long way. And it's, especially right, Anth, when. We're talking about um, a raw prospect like Josh Allen. Like, there's a lot that Allen owes Ken Dorsey. With you and the dog, which one's Josh Allen and which one's Ken Dorsey? <laughs> and I literally I drive him and he does all the work. So I'd be I'd be Dorsey. He would be Josh Allen. <laughs> He's Josh Allen. I love that. Good. That's that's all I could think about. You put him in positions to succeed. Exactly. There you go. And he takes care of it. I'm sure your yep. dog is also awesome at RPOs, just like Josh. <laughs> it makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I, I love your cubicle um, analogy. And with a raw prospect, those position coaches are so important to their development because mm-hmm. they have – they, they have such an impact on molding and kind of shaping the blueprint that is that prospect. And, you know, D- D- Brian Dable had a really interesting comment when – uh, doing his press conference for the Giants. He talked about how it took a village to raise Josh Allen. You know, Kendall, you hit it on part of it with Jordan Palmer. And then obviously Dable had an impact. We know Matt Barkley had an impact. Davis Webb had an impact. And mm. Ken Dorsey has been there really. He's been the steady guiding hand this whole time in season. And he's the one who's getting arguably the most face time, the most back and forth, that banter, their relationship, their understanding. And Dorsey having that, playing background, but also being a smart guy and being able to understand it from an analyst perspective, a game planning perspective, in addition to actually playing the quarterback position and knowing the mechanics, I think it's 
you know, no coincidence that we saw a rise in Cam Newton's game, who mm -hmm. was a physically dominant and imposing player, but needed some refinement and some polish to his game. We saw that happen on a staff that had Ken Dorsey. We saw a very similar rise and probably even more pronounced of a progression in Josh Allen. And, you know, the biggest question at this point is wondering like, okay, who had the most impact and whose mm -hmm. hand shaped things the most, but there's no doubt that Ken Dorsey's had it and an important role and driving factor in Josh's development. And it, like you said, it's key for those raw prospects because they need someone who's going to be patient and guide them. If you're just a ball of tools and talent, you need someone to kind of push you in that right direction. So you don't veer off course. And Ken Dorsey has been a very important guiding hand for, for Josh Allen. And you need guys like that with raw prospects. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, obviously we have a long ways to go. It's going to be a long off season, but I am excited to see Ken Dorsey's offense and mm. the different wrinkles that he may add. When, when I went back and watched that 2015 offense, I just, it felt very similar in a lot of ways to the bills. They had a lot of spread elements, but it was more mm -hmm. of like a power spread. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of gap, a lot of uh, bash, you know, a lot of pullers, mm -hmm. but downhill running really physical along the line. Um, and it just felt a little different than the like spread that Dable ran last few years where it was more of like you got your lighter offense linemen. They weren't really creating that displacement. They weren't as physical as McDermott really liked them which is probably why he pushed Brian Dable out of the building. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. you know, well, D those... Dable left because he hates McDermott. Yeah. Cause yeah. everyone hates McDermott, right. which is why they're all leaving. <laughs> and that's why you get guys like this that want to come to Correct. Buffalo. Right. So, um, you know, I, I felt like it was a lot more physical, uh, than what we've seen here. And again, the games change a lot too. So there are a lot of different yeah. concepts and elements that didn't exist quite as, as much and wasn't, weren't seen as often, uh, back in 2015, back in 2014. But, um, I do think one thing that stood out was tight end usage, 12 personnel. Yeah. And, and it's something we're going to talk about throughout the night. And it's something that we talked about since last year, but it's hard to ignore guys. It's hard to ignore that they used a lot of Greg Olson and Ed Dixon in their offense. Uh -huh. And they would have, uh, Olson as that kind of that flex type tight end everywhere. They would put Dixon in the backfield, uh, kind of like how bit the bills use like Gilliam and Knox and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. so Two tight ends, I think that's something that we're going to talk about tonight and something that we need to keep an eye on going forward, especially once you see some of the stats that uh, we were able to kick up. But um, the other thing I I question is like, okay, former quarterback, that's awesome. You know, it's going to help Josh Allen. Is he going to call plays from the field or from the booth? Mm. Ooh, obviously, Brian Dable, when he went up to the booth, it helped Josh mm. Allen a ton, especially prior to that, you know, 15-second play clock when he can actually communicate with Josh Allen, mm -hmm. when he can say, hey, the safeties look like they're going to spin this way. Like, he can talk to him. I wonder if Ken Dorsey is going to do the same thing up up in the booth, have all his eyes on that defense and how they could try to confuse Josh Allen. I'll get your thoughts on that, Kendall, and maybe, you know, some different wrinkles or the things that you may expect from Ken Dorsey. Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, the the speaking on the in the booth thing, I feel like offensive coordinators – gotta be in the booth the the ability to speak through the helmet to that 15 second point is so advantageous like we heard about it when jared goff was in the super bowl and how they strategically tried to get play calls in fast enough so they could talk into his headset pre-snap and let him know the looks and then yeah obviously you compare that to just being on the field and not being able to see like safety depth or safety width like things like that matter and it really helps kind of tip your hand a little bit to the offense. So I would also prefer to have him in the booth. I think that would be advantageous to the offense. Um, and in terms of wrinkles, yeah, I can't agree more with the whole more tight end usage stuff. And Brandon Bean even talked about it in his uh, postseason press press conference. He talked about, he literally added a little nugget in there. He was like, yeah, I think we need to get Dawson Knox more competition. And mm -hmm. I don't know if that's necessarily hedging his bets on, do we want to re-sign Dawson Knox after this coming year? Because that that's around the corner. But on the same note, just in terms of what's going to be best for the team this season, being multiple is, in a sense, what is best for this team. It still needs to utilize Josh Allen because Josh Allen is this offense. But to get the most out of the offense, you can't tip your hand to the defense. And having 12 personnel it makes it difficult on the defense. Is this a run? Is this a pass? It's kind of a heavy look, but it's 
I mean, we see the Bucks do it a lot. The Bucks love their tight yeah. ends, and yeah. they don't tip their hand on if they're running or passing, given 12, 13, or 11 personnel. Yeah, and I think, you know, the whole physicality angle, it, it you know, if the, of that 2015 offense, of some of the offenses we're going to talk about later and uh, Aaron Cromer's offense in L.A., it, it adds a different physicality element, you know, than having your slot receiver, Cole Beasley, out there. Maybe you would now have two tight ends. Diggs and Gabriel Davis, who is their best, mm -hmm. you know, blocking wide receiver. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it does add some different elements to the offense and that I'm excited about. You saw the bills down the stretch, bring in an extra offensive lineman. Uh, they want that angle. And that's something Aaron Cromer did back in 20, uh, 15 and 16 as well, mm -hmm. as we will talk about. So we talked about how important Ken Dorsey was to Josh Allen's uh, career. And obviously Joe Brady has some big shoes to fill, right? Anthony, uh, and we're going to talk about Joe Brady, some of his stops along the way. And I want to focus on what the Wonder Kid can bring to the Bills offense. So why don't you kind of give everyone a background and on, uh, on Joe Brady? So I think most people know him from being the passing game um, coordinator uh, for LSU in that 2019 season, that national championship season, where LSU had arguably the greatest offensive season of any college team ever. It was just wow, but he's had a, a decent track record. You know, he played wide receiver at William and Mary, uh, Sean McDermott's alma mater. And then he became a linebackers coach at William and Mary. He was a graduate assistant at Penn state. Then he became an offensive assistant for the new Orleans saints learned under Sean Payton and then stayed down in Louisiana, became the passing game coordinator for LSU and then was the offensive coordinator for the Carolina Panthers and got some highlights there for, uh, that LSU season in 2019. So again, they were national champions, 48.4 points per game. Jamar Chase scored over 20 touchdowns that year, which set a record. Uh, and Joe Burrow, you know, we're focusing on the quarterback here because Brady's a QB's coach now. Joe Burrow, 76.3 completion percentage. These numbers are stupid. Uh, 5,671 yards, 60 touchdowns, only six interceptions. He won the Heisman Trophy. Again, set the world on fire. A lot of spread yeah. offense, a lot of getting the running backs out in routes and running real routes. You know, Clyde Edwards Hilaire was the running back on that yeah. team. He was going in motion and running corner routes and running routes that wide receivers run. And he had a career high in receptions and yards in 2019. So Brady just putting everybody into that spread offense. He goes to Carolina. He's the OC um, from 2020 through 2021. He was fired in week 13 of this past season. As I mentioned earlier, he and head coach Matt Rule just did not see eye to eye when it came to how to run the offense. You know, it really – from the reports, it all came down to Matt Rule wanted to run the ball more, and Joe Brady <laughs> did not. Um, it was so, so ironic <laughs> when that came out and the timing of that story coming out. And, and you know, obviously with the Dable and, and McDermott supposed yep. drama, like it was just it was just hilarious. Yep. And then everybody's saying like, oh, well, you know, Dable wanted out because McDermott wanted to run the ball a ton. And then <laughs> yes. they bring in Joe Brady, who literally seemingly just wants to pass nonstop and run RPO. So that was funny. Um, and then we got some points there on – uh, Brady's philosophy. So that first quote is a direct quote from Joe Brady. This is his belief when it comes to offense. Um, he quote wants to force the defense to defend every blade of grass and get speed in space. He wants to use personnel. He wants to use a variety of formations to put the defense in conflict, loves speed. And again, making defenders defend every blade of grass by spreading them out, um, stretching them horizontally and vertically. Um, he's going to use vertical concepts and sprinkle in a lot and layer in wrinkles like switch releases and rubs and anything that he can to take advantage of matchups that the defense is trying to create. He loves glance route RPOs and RPOs in general. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he loves his running backs in the passing game and he favors going into empty personnel. If mm -hmm. the offensive line can hold up. So if there's a guy who favors and wants just five man protections in a spread offense, it's going to be Joe Brady, which also, you know, speaks to what he is going to look for in the offensive line and partnering with Aaron Cromer and seeing how they can hold up. And yeah, it, it's, it's an important piece for Brady because he steps in as the QB coach and what the Bills have done previously the last couple of years with their RPOs and knowing how heavy Brady is into that RPO world. Um, it We mentioned that continuity piece, and it, it really continues here. So the Bills love RPOs. In 2021, they ran RPOs at a 19% usage rate, which was the sixth most in the NFL. 
They ran RPOs at a 22% usage rate in the red zone, which was the fourth most in the NFL. Uh, They also had a 21% play action usage rate last year, which was the fourth most play action, not the same as an RPO, but ties into that run action, trying to fool the defense type of look. And yeah, you're, you're going to get that a lot from Joe Brady. And I wanted to pull a couple quotes um, here when it comes to, uh, what he likes to do as well. He likes to get his tight ends flexed out. He likes to work the middle of the field, like slants from his receivers. Um, and again, especially when it comes to those RPOs running those slants, taking advantage of the middle of the field and really attacking the defense. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned RPOs. It's something we're going to break, uh, some break out some of the clinic tape, uh, from Joe Moorhead. And that's where I want to focus. So uh, this is an episode where we're kind of showing you guys, giving you background on these coaches, where they've been their influences. Obviously, RPOs uh, were a big one for Joe Brady, and it started uh, back at Penn State back in 2015, 2016. As you can see on the screen, he was a GA at Penn State. And, you know, a lot of the GAs that were there with him always said that he always picked up things a lot quicker. You know, that's why he was the wonder kid. He always, you know, (laughs) picked up offenses quicker. And um, and they also kind of credited that to him coaching linebackers at William and Mary the year before. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Mm -hmm. William and Mary is uh, Sean McDermott's alma mater. Um, and so they, they said that, you know, he, part of the reason why he was able to pick up so quickly was knowing how defenses like the spin and, and things like that, mm. uh, coverages. Um, and so when he was at Penn state in 2015, they had just hired under James Franklin, the head coach, they hired a new OC. His name was Joe Moorhead and Moorhead at the time was again, 2015. Think about RPOs. I mean, not many teams were running like true RPOs that we're seeing nowadays, they had run pass tags where, you know, maybe they had a pass or run called and then to have a pass tag attached to it, but not true RPOs. And this guy was running, um, you know, at the ground floor is what he says in the clinic when it comes to running true RPOs and the modern triple option where you can obviously mm-hmm. hand it off to the running back on his own read, have the quarterback keep it, but also throw it kind of like that Chip Kelly type offense at Oregon. And he was at the ground floor of this RPO revolution. And, you know, really consider one of the masterminds of RPOs and he's still running that at Akron nowadays. And Joe Brady as a GA there just kind of sidled up to him to Joe Moorhead and really just started soaking up like a sponge RPOs and that, that portion mm-hmm. of the offense. And to the point where when coaches were test him, uh, he would just spit it back. Like no problem. The other GAs were having issues trying to learn the offense. And so with that said, I want to get into some of the film, on Joe Moorhead and the clinic that he put on a couple of years ago uh, while he was at uh, uh, Oregon, because he was coaching at Oregon at the time, but he had a lot of cutups, as you can see here, um, from Mississippi State, some Oregon. Um, and again, it's, it's centered around RPOs. And we talked about how, you know, maybe this route of coaching hires was more of a continuity angle, as much as it could be from hiring guys pretty much outside of a a coaching tree or outside of the building and um philosophically these ideas of rpos obviously Mm -hmm. as anthony ripped off those stats you know 19 percent of the rpos 19 percent of the playbook were rpos last year for josh allen and you gotta think about some of those were just straight handoffs so that you Mm -hmm. know that's not even necessarily being probably even being tracked when it's Mm -hmm. handed off because it looks just like an inside zone or a power yep um so 19 percent of the playbook so we're gonna take a listen to Joe Moorhead here, again, the guy that Joe Brady was heavily influenced by at Penn State. All right, so here we're split zone. We're going to once again have hitch and inside fade to the field as our overloaded box or our pressure answer. Uh, We don't like that. We're going to identify the defender that we want to put in conflict. That's that guy. All right. In position to tackle the ball care at or near the line of scrimmage. Absolutely. Absolutely. Going to win on the glance off a split zone. So you heard Anthony mention the glance route, the glance RPO, and Joe Moore is talking about this here. And you Bills fans should recognize this play, to be mm-hmm. honest, because it's mm-hmm. one they've run for several years now. And so if you look at this play, it just, again, it's putting a guy in conflict. So you see the defender that he has circled there. That's the conflict defender. If that guy comes down into the box to defend this run, well, guess what? Then they're going to take that glance route right over the middle and obviously try to score a touchdown there. It's a, it's a good call, too, in the red zone. This is when the Bills, as Anthony said, in the red zone, 22% of the time, the Bills were running RPOs, fourth most in the NFL. 
So here's that glance RPO. You're going to see that guy he circled, you know, come down and defend uh, the run, and he's Conflict. and he's just going to throw it. Now, stop guy. All right. In position to tackle the ball carrier out or near the line of scrimmage. Absolutely. Going to win on the glance off a of split zone. And so now we look at, okay, LSU. So, you know, after a couple of years, you see, uh, you know, Brady do some time with the Saints and obviously do some time uh, with the Tigers, LSU, 2019, hell of a run as Anthony Pro out. Well, mm -hmm. here's, here's the glance RPO to the top of the screen. Now, again, here's your read. What does that guy do, guys? He stays back. They stay in a too high shell. So what does that do for the run game? That just gives the bill the Bills. Mm -hmm. That just gives the Tigers <laughs> the numbers right here with with Clyde Edwards Alaire, and he keeps it and gets up the field. This is the type of versatility that you want in an offense, right, Kendall? Yeah, I mean the ability to read that guy in conflict, and this is what Josh Allen did so so well this past year, where it's like. Yeah, this this safety up there in the top right of your screen, you're reading him, and if he if he sinks down, then that glance route right behind him is going to be right. wide open. But if he sits where he is right now, then yeah, you have a weak box. Like already, this is a weak box. Look at this. Mm. That that six guy is what seven French. yards back. Yeah, this is like a Bills defensive defensive box. <laughs> <laughs> so no question, if that safety isn't aggressively playing downhill, at least near the time of the snap, you got to hand the ball off, and it's huge. For the offense, like you alluded to earlier, it's the modern form of the triple option. Yeah, and you see uh, Lair, he doesn't even meet the safety till he's what? Uh -huh. Almost 10 yards down the field. Like this is <laughs> this is why the Bills run so much of it. And it really does play to Josh's strengths. Uh I know Aaron Quinn brought up this week to me uh, in a DM, like, like is, is Josh really even that good at running this? Yeah, he's absolutely very good at it. For so many reasons, obviously the rushing element, the mobility element, yeah. but obviously the arm strength element too. If he makes a bad read and maybe he gets a muddied read from that safety on any of these RPOs or a muddied read from a linebacker who's the conflict defender, Josh can still make up for it with yep. his arm strength, you know, mm -hmm. and you got to think about it. These type of plays, the offensive linemen on RPOs on run pass options are blocking it up as if the ball is going to be handed off. So a lot of times they are too three, maybe sometimes four yards down the field. But, <laughs> you know, Josh is still able to get the ball there so quickly that, you know, it, it really it, it's really beneficial to the Bills and the offense to run that many RPOs. And so here's one of them. Here's that glance RPO, right, guys? So Gabriel Davis, bottom of the screen, he, he's running the glance route. So as we just profiled, as Joe Moorhead just profiled, who's the conflict defender? Who's the read? Mr. Kyle Duggar right here. and you guys will see what Duggar does here. The Bills show a power run. They pull the right guard. Uh -huh. So there's the mesh. Josh Allen's eyes are right on Duggar. Duggar creeps down. Middle of the field's wide open. Gabriel Davis versus Bryant. And Josh Allen just threads it for the touchdown, Anthony. Yeah, well, yeah we broke this play down um, in the film room after the playoff game. And we, we spoke about how it was indicative of how this game had gone. So Josh Allen working the RPO and understanding who he's reading, who he's keying on. And, and this in essence is what the RPO game is about and what Joe Brady's about in his tutelage from Joe Moorhead, you know, Joe Moorhead again, functioning into this RPO world where his idea was to keep the seventh defender from wreaking havoc. So usually you have like so six in the box. You want to put that seventh defender into conflict somehow, make him wrong no matter what he does. If he stays and sinks and doesn't come up, cool, you hand the ball off and you take advantage of the numbers like you saw in the previous clip with Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. If the defender comes up and tries to play the run like Kyle Duggar does here, the quarterback takes advantage and he hits the glance route right behind him. And that's a huge important piece of this entire RPO world because the run game – the more you have a successful run game, the more successful your RPOs are. And that comes right from Joe Moorhead himself, who, quote, said a little, um, when it comes to RPOs, it's a little contingent upon personnel, and it, quote, requires an offense to be effective both as a passing offense and as a running one. And in this game here, this play is a perfect example of that. Yeah. The Bills had been successfully running against the Patriots all game. The Patriots you know, bite on that run action because they have to respect it. And Josh Allen hits that RPO right behind with a nice quick throw, taking advantage of his skill set and the abilities that he has as a quarterback.
Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, this throw is just ridiculous. I mean, you would think that Josh would throw it a little more to the left of the hash. I mean, just uh, he just leads Gabriel Davis, middle of the field open, beautiful catch on the other What's end. also nice, too, like, you know, you you mentioned why Josh is good for RPOs. He can make those throws without being in, in a great position with That's his that, base. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, he's like, he's not in great throwing position here, like, but he makes it because of arm talent. And when you have a quick trigger combined with, arm strength combined with being able to throw off of multiple platforms and multiple arm angles. That means you can ride that mesh point a little more, or Eric, like you mentioned, if you are wrong in that read, you can still course correct and make up for it with your talent and your ability. So yeah, Josh is a very, very effective RPO quarterback. Right. And so we're moving on a little bit to Brady when he was at LSU again, and here's a play from the 2019 LSU playbook. When Joe, uh, Joe Brady was there, Joe Burrow was there. Um, and we're going to take a look at these two plays. And it's funny that these two plays are on the same page because when we get to the film, you're going to see the bills run this play, uh, in, you know, last year, and it's almost identical to what we see on the play. So these are, uh, part of the install day 11 install of the LSU playbook. And, and if you look at the top diagram here, uh, if you start with the X receiver off to the left that they call that the pre-snap access. So you're going to see a speed out there or. Uh, a go route by that wide receiver and the quarterback Burrow Allen can look out there. And if based on the leverage of that corner, he, he can run uh, the wide receiver can run two different routes and the quarterback can hit him on any, at any given time. So if, if there's off coverage here from the corner and inside leverage, then you're going to see the speed out right here to the left. And uh, if you see um, press or cloud coverage, then you're going to see the go route. And so if you see like a cover two or Tampa two type look, you're going to see that go route from him and they're going to test that safety deep. Um, so you have that portion of this RPO or run game tag. Uh, obviously you have on the right side, you have uh, a stick concept. So the F is just running a diagonal route at two to three yards of depth out to the flats. You're having a five yard stick route from the Z right there from a condensed set. And you can even see like the diagram has, you know, two yards uh, splits between each other. Uh, so you have those combinations, you have those options as passes, but again, there's a run called here too. The quarterback could easily just hand it off here based on the numbers in the box. So mm -hmm. giving your quarterback options to the bottom, you're going to see this play from the bills against the chiefs. When Josh Allen threaded this play for a touchdown to Emmanuel Sanders in the red zone, um, we're going to see that and, and a different spin on that from the bills here on the next play. But I mean, just giving your quarterback options, right, Kendall? Like, this is what you want to see. Here is the uh, corner route right here from Emmanuel Sanders. You see the diagonal route right here from McKenzie, and they even bring Knox across the formation. So three eligibles right there to the short side of the field, to the top of the screen. I mean, that's just giving your quarterback options. And you see Josh. Uh, kind of read this guy right here. This guy kind of pinches down, so it's like it's easy. They're going to throw it. Josh is going to throw it. Mm -hmm. Josh looks to the flats to hold this corner right here. And then, again, Kendall, he threads this ball to Emmanuel Sanders for a touchdown. I mean, this play just it, – it's not fair because you have that wrinkle that you just added with knocks on the beneath route, and it puts, it puts the conflict defender in even more conflict. Does he want to go chase – McKenzie on that that arrow that flat route or is he going to take away Knox on the beneath route and it just adds so many more options to this but this is why I like the Joe Brady ads so much because of the continuity aspect of Ken Dorsey and having Joe Brady so familiar with RPOs it, it works in two ways where we have Dorsey who obviously had a hand in the passing game this past year yep but then also Joe Brady's so familiar with RPOs that if he doesn't like something that he sees and he feels like there could be a little tweak, it's not like he's not well-versed enough in RPOs to speak his mind. So he could add a little bit of wrinkles to these RPO actions that the Bills have already used. And we could really see this RPO game get even more efficient than it already is. Yeah, and so there's that play. And then, Anthony, you remember this one. Uh, to Dawson Knox. This is the stick concept that we talked about, that top diagram. Um, true modern triple option, right, Anthony? <laughs> yeah, th it's funny how there's been like a theme this year of football being cyclical and coming back to things. And 
the RPOs that you've started to see now, like I harken back to the old school triple option where you've got the dive and then you let the dive go and the QB can either keep it or you can go to the pitch man. Right. And it's all about putting defenders and defenses in conflict and making them wrong no matter what they do. And yeah, this is <laughs> this. I laugh every time because I just Judon is so mad after this play and yeah. understandably like you're wrong no matter what. So it, if you if you take it right there, right, if Judon doesn't come down, Josh Allen gives it to Devin Singletary and it's a touchdown. So Judon's yeah. there in the red sleeves. He's he he crashes down. He squeezes down. If he's not there, Singletary scores. So he comes down, but then he tries to pop out because Allen kept it. So now Allen has the ability to run into the end zone if Judon or Duggar don't come after him like they do. And if Duggar sits there on Knox, Josh Allen runs. But Duggar comes up on Josh Allen, so Josh Allen just flips it then to Dawson Knox. Three options, modern-day triple option football, but instead of the dive and the QB run and the pitch man, you've got the dive, a QB run, and a pass now in the form of an RPO. And again, it's all based on this concept of making the defense wrong no matter what they do. Matthew Judon actually plays this well. Like he squeezes down. You highlighted him right there. Mm -hmm. He squeezes down on the run action and then still manages to pop back outside and influence Josh Allen a little bit. Manny drags Jalen Mills out with his route, but Duggar cues in on this run action from Josh. He's the conflict defender there. And he's beat no matter what he does at this point. Because if he stays with Knox, Josh runs it. If he comes up and plays Josh, Josh flips it to Dawson Knox. And this, in a nutshell, is what RPO offense is. Putting defenders into conflict, making them wrong no matter what they do, taking yeah. advantage of that extra defender, and making them be put into a disadvantageous position for them. And then you just need a guy who can execute and pull the trigger uh, whichever way you need to. And Josh has done that very well when it's come uh, to the RPO game. And, you know, as the offensive line got better, the RPO game from the Buffalo Bills got better. And again, that's where Brady helps. They want to run these RPOs. I also wanted to throw in one little uh, quote from Joe Brady that I think puts RPO offense uh, into a nutshell a little bit. So it comes from uh, Joe Moorhead. So this is a Joe Moorhead phrase. Um, when he talks, when Brady talks about RPOs, he calls them a Chipotle offense, like the restaurant Chipotle, um, meaning you can put a lot of stuff together and it can taste really good, but it's nothing really special. And that's all RPO is <laughs> like, it's not some crazy fancy thing. It's basically modern day triple option football. That's all designed around putting certain defenders into conflict, making them wrong, no matter what they do. And it can work out great, but the ingredients aren't crazy. Yeah, I that was such a good quote. I'm so glad you I found know, I that. I love it. <laughs> um, I just love like I like the Ken Dorsey hire. I like the Joe Brady hire. But when we talk about the next coach, Aaron Cromer, I I mean it's a home run. It's a grand slam. It's really the hire that kind of puts everything over the top because the Bills needed a good offensive line coach, and to me, Cromer is one of the top five offensive line coaches uh, in the league, and for them to get him um, back in Buffalo yeah. and his familiarity with the the city, um, it, it it just really excited me. And and going over some of this clinic film and and that's what's great about uh, it's every year they have a clinic for offensive line coaches, offensive linemen. Um, that's called the Cool Clinic, and all of these guys, old heads, new heads, whatever, they meet in a spot in Cincinnati and they just talk shop. They share. They do presentations. They share their notes. I mean, they talk ball, and they're very open about things. And, you know, one of the clinics uh, that Cromer attended, it was one of the clinics that Cromer attended back in 2016 when he was with the Bills. And we're going to get to some of that footage. And uh, this hire, Kendall, uh, I want you to kind of give everyone a little background aside from, uh, obviously, when his he was coaching with the Bills. Um, it's, it's just, uh, I think the Bills – knock this one out of the park. And I think the bills fans, maybe even fans that weren't, aren't totally aware of Cromer and maybe because of age and they weren't watching football back then, or uh, just like you said, maybe aren't into coaching like we are uh, as, as nerds, but um, mm -hmm. give everyone a little background on Cromer because uh, he is a, a well-decorated coach. Yeah. I think that's the key with Cromer. It's, it's the fact that he has so much experience and you can see that with the first bullet point, 19 years of NFL coaching experience. And that works so well 
when you put it together with a couple of guys that haven't really had a whole lot of coaching experience in the NFL with Brady and Dorsey. So this is a really nice blend of hirings. But you see him, he started in the NFL with the Raiders, uh, started as an assistant offensive line coach and quickly got up to the head offensive line coach and even got that Super Bowl appearance in the 2003 Super Bowl. And then ends up going and takes a kind of similar administrative type role uh, with the Buccaneers after playing them in the Super Bowl in 2003. Uh, and also in that administrative role, then carves out a niche for offensive line coach. You see, he just keeps coming back to offensive line. And then he goes to uh, New Orleans in 2008 and has a hand in the running game there as the running backs coach. And then once again, after a year, establishes himself as the offensive line coach and eventual Super Bowl champion on that team in 2009. And then, of course, the whole Bounty Gate stuff that happened in New Orleans. He actually stepped up and was the interim head coach in 2012 for the first, uh, I believe it was six games of that season. Uh And then he finds himself going to Chicago after that, you know, crazy year in, in New Orleans. And he's part of a really prolific offense in Chicago with uh, Jay Cutler, Matt Forte, and Brandon Marshall. And I know you got some stats to rattle off about that. Um, And then obviously gets to Buffalo after that stint as offensive coordinator, kind of gets back down to his niche with offensive line coaching. And obviously in his stop with Buffalo, you know, both years, 2015 and 16, Bills were first in rushing yards, touchdowns, and yards per attempt in both of those years, which is nutty. Um, Eric, obviously you'll be able to talk about those years. And then we see him most recently with the Rams in 2017 as the offensive line coach, and then gets promoted to run game coordinator on top of those responsibilities in 2018 through 2020. And also had that Super Bowl appearance in 2018. Yeah. You know, Anthony, we talked about this a few weeks ago, uh, when we talked about the meltdown, the 13 second meltdown and Mm -hmm. how communication lacked there. Um, this is one of Cromer's, you know, stronger suits. Uh, he keeps things simple. He communicates to his players. Clearly they understand and, and, uh, you know, know what to expect from him. And in turn, you know, his clarificating a clarification of terms, techniques, Mm -hmm. assignments, Mm -hmm. like they understand what is expected of them. And, uh, that's really, really big. And, um, because players need to know, like, not just, um, you know, hey, this is your assignment, but why? So uh-huh. that they understand the grander scheme of not just their assignment, but the play itself, the drive itself. Um, it, it's really important. And his techniques his and way he teaches things, it doesn't just affect the offensive line, as you're going to see tonight in the film room. He, the way he teaches guys, it really reverberates across the entire offense. I'm talking tight ends. I'm talking wide receivers. And when you see some of these clips from 2015, you're going to see uh, wide receivers making blocks. You're going to see tight ends making some amazing uh, blocks on pin and pulls, on outside zone runs. Um, He just really maximizes the skill sets of his offensive linemen. Uh, Obviously, in 2015, 2016, those are the years when he was coaching up Glenn, uh, Incognito, Wood, Miller was, you know, at first and second year. Uh, were with Cromer and he stood out mm. and was playing really well uh, under Cromer. Even Jordan Mills, guys. Jordan Mills <laughs> had some good games put together uh, with Cromer as the offensive line coach. He just does a good job of bringing guys together, making them work as a unit. Whether he, when he was in Buffalo, any of these stops that you see on the screen, that is, and, and you you Google his name and offensive line, and you're gonna hear all the same things because that's how good of a coach he is. And regardless of he's running, I saw one of the comments in the chat room. You know, I wonder how uh, the zone offensive line run principles are going to and, and gap principles are going to mesh with RPOs. That, that's not a problem like that. Mm-hmm. All that stuff, RPOs in both of those realms are no problem bringing those together. Um, you know, he's a multiple uh, scheme type uh, run coordinator, uh, run game schemer. And it's just nasty regardless. If he's running zone more times than not, you guys are thinking, oh, that's a finesse type run game with lighter offensive linemen. No, 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 no. His brand of his own run is physical. And I think you see that again on the offensive line with the tight ends, with the wide receivers, Anthony. And that is what really is exciting for me. Uh, Again, having seen him as a coach in Buffalo a few years ago. 
Yeah, he's he's well versed. He's well traveled. I, I think one of the points. I mean, you made a ton of great ones, but the one that really intrigued me the most about him is the whole maximizing the skill sets of mm-hmm. his players. Right? You know, it's we saw it ironically with Rex Ryan, who he served under. Right? The we had this Bills defense, this cold front, uh, four three four man rush defense under Jim Schwartz, and then Rex Ryan comes and takes over. And instead of fitting his ideology to the roster and players he had, he tried to reverse that and make everybody fit his system. And this awesome defense that the Bills had under Jim Schwartz kind of fell apart. And, you know, we've tweeted several stats out, you know, from Cromer's uh, most recent stop with the Rams as their O-line coach and run game coordinator from 2018 to 2020 and how much zone they ran. And people, you know, were commenting like, okay, like, we were good with gap at the back end of 2021. Like, what does that mean? And I think the good thing about Cromer is it's not like he's come in and he's like, well, we're running zone no matter yeah. what, or well, nope, we're running gap no matter what. He's going to look and see what he's got, and they're going to tailor their scheme to the skill sets of the players that they have. And then once they've identified those skill sets, they're going to maximize strengths. They're going to mitigate weaknesses, right? And then he's going to coach everyone up with, like you said, Eric, the whys behind the what's and getting everybody on that same page. So even if the right now, as we stand, if the Buffalo Bills ran that same offensive line back from 2021, Dawkins, Bates, Morse, Daryl Williams, and Spencer Brown, this offensive line is already going to be better without changing anybody in person now, because they're going to get better coaching up front. Cause Cromer is one of the best. He's phenomenal. And to add to a point that Kendall mentioned that I really love, you know, we've got somebody in Ken Dorsey who's still young in his coaching experience, right? And it's his first time as an offensive coordinator and first time as a play caller. And then you've got someone like Joe Brady, who's still young in his career, even though he's well-traveled. Now you've got somebody on that offensive side with experience, with confidence, with leadership, who can guide them a little bit in terms of their functioning. And I think it's a really great hire. And one last point, you know, because again, Kendall mentioned it, and I want to get it out there because I, I didn't even remember this myself. So he was that offensive coordinator for the Bears for two years under Mark Tressman. And in his first year as Bears offensive coordinator, they had the second best scoring offense in the league with 445 points. And they also broke team records in total yards, passing yards, passing touchdowns, and first downs. So this guy's specialty in Aaron Cromer is the offensive mm-hmm. line but he's just a good offensive mind. He understands the game. He coaches it up. He explains it. This, you know, you said it on Twitter, Eric, like this is a home run. This is a home run. It's a tremendous hire. No disrespect to Bobby Johnson, but just right now, the Buffalo Bills offensive line got better without doing anything on the roster. Yeah, they're in good hands, uh, obviously, with Cromer. And so, again, I I said at the top, we're going to take a look at some clinic footage of Cromer teaching. I, I, I said to Anthony offline, like, I love having access to this type of footage, and I know most fans don't have access, so I wanted to play some of these clips of him teaching it because we can sit here and act like we know what we're talking about, but guess what? We know what we're talking about because we can watch clips like this. We can watch clinics like this. We can go on YouTube, learn uh, how Cromer teaches things. Yeah, you can study it. Well, this is uh, what's going to be fun about this film room. Again, another clinic, this time on Cromer, and the thing that he stresses, again, a physical brand of football, but He's all. He's a man that always mentions leverage and staying mm. rooted. Staying. Uh, I said it about um, Marquise, Marquise Hayes, Hayes, right? I said, hey, you know, I want to see that offensive lineman, that guard, stay rooted more, stay grounded, keep his feet in the ground, and play with a good base. And he, he's not a guy that does it all that well. But you're going to see in some of these clips that uh, you know Cromer's teaching why his guys need to stay grounded, why he needs to those guys need to keep his feet on the turf and use hands as leverage rather than, you know, mm. coming into a combination block and using your shoulder. He's going to explain to you exactly, you know, what he teaches as a coach. And so then when we get to the clips afterwards, you guys are going to understand why he teaches that. And you're going to see it on film tonight, but you're also going to see it in the games for the next few years, which is exciting as a fan. So uh, I'll stop yakking here and uh, <laughs> let let uh, Aaron Cromer do the teaching. Johnny Miller again. On contact, he's grounded. Watch. Heavy feet in the ground, his left foot slightly out. We're feet on the insteps, knees inside. His, his, his feet, his, his right foot's the same. His hands are on. 
All right, we'll talk about that in a second. But he's grounded. Now, what we're showing here in addition to the grounding, watch this. Watch his hands. So if you were coaching, if you were coaching a couple years back, like when Jimmy started, everything was about this leverage. Are your shoulder pads lower than the defender's shoulder pads? Are, you know, we're watching the tape and, and making sure that you can't see your shoulder pads because then you're not, you're too high. You can see, well, we're talking about hand leverage. Now we're using hands for leverage. You're not always, if you're not gonna use momentum, all right, and you're gonna use leverage, then you're using hand leverage. All right, not shoulder pad leverage. Do you want your knees bent? Do you want to have some forward lean? Yes. Do you want to be low? Yes. But you're going to lift the defender with hand leverage, okay? So in order to get that, you've got to get your hands on them. And so Jimmy was talking about playing long. And you can see that in this case right here, John Miller, okay? John Miller is playing long. Watch. Watch him put, run it back and forth. Watch his hands get under and get long as we get going. So he wants to, he's winning with hand leverage. And we'll talk about the double team and all that in a second. But So you heard him talk mm -hmm. about the hand leverage, and obviously you can see the base of John Miller there. And so normally, you know, especially like inside zone type runs, normally these guys are coming hip to hip, knee to knee, and simultaneously hitting that defensive tackle. And then what? Creating that displacement. And then one of these guys is going to peel off eventually. Mm -hmm and pick up that linebacker or just drive that defensive tackle, uh, you know, into the linebacker. Well, they teach, you know, he teaches it a little different. He wants this guy to get hand leverage on this guy and this guy be the driver. You guys have heard me say it for years now. One guy is getting leverage and then the other guy is the driver. He's the one creating the displacement. It's something that, again, I learned from Cromer and I honestly, I, I probably say it anytime we do offensive line uh, breakdowns. And um, so we're going to take a look at, uh, a play here uh, of, of, you know, 2015, I think this was, uh, Bill's offense. I mean, mm. this is when they had Tyrod. This was, coincident coincidentally enough, this was Tyrod's, like, best passing game. But Yeah, I Robert Woods <laughs> had a crazy good game in this one, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I just want you to watch every single of these offensive linemen. I'll point it out. Uh, they have, uh, like, a tackle overcall. So you see, uh, you know, they have a, a few offensive linemen here and the tight ends over here next to the right guard. But just watch some of the techniques as I let this roll. Look at the formation, you know, inverted wishbone out of a, you know, a pistol type look. So that's exciting all in itself. The Bills can bring back a pistol type look for Josh Allen and these running backs to kind of incorporate zone type runs or even some of these gap runs. Oh, forget about it. You'll, you'll have me breaking pretty much all of those plays down. But I want you to start with the front side. Anthony, we talk about those pin or down blocks. This one's an easy one for the big Cordy Glenn right there. Um, and on the front side of there as the ball is going outside and just look some of the dressing. Obviously you got the running back coming over here. Jerome Felton's leading this way. You got a running back going that way, a little eye candy, a little, and, uh, Tyrod Taylor holding that backside defender. But again, watch Richie incognito as this nose tackle is trying to play into this gap right here. You see incognito boom, bump him right oh, over to Eric yep. Wood. Nice and easy. That's an easy reach block. You're not just relying on the speed and quickness of Eric Wood to get out of the blocks there and make that reach block on a two eye, which is a damn tough reach block on his own type run. So you got Richie Incognito working that near shoulder with, with force there and then getting to the next level. So you got that, but even more so backside watch John Miller right here on the backside of this run again, technique, get his hand on him. And then he realized, Hey, you know what? Maybe I'm not going to be able to reach to the front side here. So what does he do? I call it a hook and run. You see him transition. It's almost like a rip. You see him rip mm -hmm. right here with that right arm, get up under it, and just hold on to it and just run with him. He, he's not – Jerron Reed's not going to be able to get by him, and obviously he's not going to get back into the play. So just some really good stuff uh, on the front side of this run, really good technique, and uh, obviously you see some of the uh, the, the pull and then uh, Felton getting out in front, and a nice run by the running back there and getting up the field. You know, that's just a well-coached offensive line, and here here's a play – uh, versus the Rams, Anthony and, and Kendall here. So watch the interior offensive lineman here. I had it diagrammed right here. Watch the work that they do. Watch the offensive lineman get initial leverage. You see the hand leverage right here by uh, the offensive lineman. And then here comes the driver right there. Look at the displacement that it creates, widens him, and then look at the backside. 
again, this guy's working into the defensive tackle. He's coming to help. And then they're working to this linebacker right there. Watch it all unfold. Great blocking. Cut back lane right there. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the backside tight end doesn't pick up the edge defender. But, again, well-coached offensive line, Anthony. Uh, talk about this. Talk about the displacement and just how – I'm telling you, when it comes to run game and Aaron Cromer, it's it's like poetry, man, regardless of what scheme it is. Yeah, it really is a beautiful thing to see. You mentioned the word displacement. I think that's one thing that is usually indicative of a Cromer coached offensive line. There is just push from the offensive line time after time. There is a reestablishing of the line of scrimmage time after time, and it comes in a variety of forms. And what I like is you'll see the same thing across the – the teams that he coached in the previous clip. I hope everybody paid attention to what John Miller did on that backside with that hook and run and how he ripped through. You're going to see something very similar from Cooper cup. As we start to go through mm -hmm. in these clips, it's something that Cromer drills into everyone. And you see the technique, you see the hand placement, you see the creation of leverage and then the drive. We're showing you different runs, different schemes, different players, different coordinators, coaches, all this kind of stuff. But the technique that all of these players are using remains the same and it's strong and it's purposeful. And the reason it's strong and purposeful and it works across all these different players and teams is because it's being coached by the same guy. And when you get that type of force combined with technique, man, that's just that's just a huge thing for an offensive line, especially one like the Buffalo Bills, right, where we've talked about it for the last couple of years. They've just been this middling offensive line. They haven't had mm -hmm. anything to hang their hat on. They haven't been a top unit. They've been too roller coastering, up and down, and ebbs and flows. That starts to go away. You get sustainability. You get a baseline level combined with allowing guys to reach their potential and start to get better because you're going to get technique and you're going to get a mentality and an identity from coach Cromer. And it's, man, it's really just a beautiful thing to see all these guys working in. Like you said, it's like poetry, everybody doing their job, getting a piece. And this, this Seattle one is really nice too. Cause this is still, it's towards the back end, but this is still that Legion of Boom Seattle defense. Like you yeah. did not run on them. You didn't pass on them. They were one gapping and they were aggressive. The Bills came into Seattle. I believe this was a Monday night game and they got screwed a little bit. Oh, this is the game where Richard Sherman took out our kicker at yeah. halftime at, at the end of the first <laughs> half. So there were some shenanigans in this one, but you didn't push Seattle around in their house and you didn't take advantage of them with technique in their house. The Bills did that in this game and you saw the Rams do it as well. And it's because of Coach Cromer. Yeah, Kendall, I mean, talk about, you know, the diversity in the run game. Like, whatever Ken Dorsey wants to run, uh, he's got an experienced off of offensive line coach that can incorporate uh, zone runs inside or outside, gap runs, man runs. Like, having that type of Rolodex uh, at his disposal in Ken Dorsey, a first-time play caller, uh, it's going to go a long way for the Bills offense, especially the run game. Yeah, I can't agree more. Like the multiplicity that this is going to bring to the offense is going to be huge because I don't think at the end of the day, because he used zone runs means that he's going to use zone runs here. I remember there was a clip in your, you know, your thread back from like 2019 where he literally talked about how it's okay to be wrong and it's okay to be coachable as a coach. And maybe there is someone that knows something more than you. And sometimes that comes down to the players saying, hey, I'm not comfortable in this sort of in this sort of scheme, I need to be schemed up in this way. And the ability for a coach to be coachable in that way makes it, uh, enables it to be a zone or a gap scheme offense in a gap scheme running game. So I think there's going to be no problem in terms of what we decide to do. And if I don't, I don't even think we're going to see a, you know, decisive 75, 25 split. I think it's going to be very balanced because at the end of the day, what he preaches is so simple and yeah. just rooted in technique. It's just like talk about just being grounded and focusing on hand placement and leverage with your hands. It's it's so simple, but it's also so digestible as a player where you're just like, OK, I just I just got to get to my spot with good footwork, keep my feet in the ground, use the ground to generate my power instead of trying to generate my power with momentum. Like he said, it's it's such a simple way to teach the position and that's why I feel like it's been so successful for him throughout the years. Yeah, Anthony, you know, he alluded to, you know, hands 
and how important feet are like that. Look at mm -hmm. this play, you know, to, to final, you know, finalize this clip. Watch the defensive tackles holding this offensive lineman. It doesn't want him to scoop to his linebacker, right? Well, watch him disengage with the hand right there. And then now watch, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Kendall just mentioned it, using the ground as the power and the force. Look at him latch on to this guy. Give him a little headbutt first, so a little physicality. Hmm. <laughs> Look at him and latch on with his hands inside, but then watch the pad level and watch 51 elevate right here. Look at him. He gets lifted oh, off yeah. of the ground. Again, physical brand of football, and this is a zone run. This is not a finesse zone run game. It's a power zone run game. Uh, that's what's exciting about Cromer, regardless of what he teaches, what techniques, what assignments he's putting on his offensive linemen. It's a physical brand of football. And I know McDermott, when he realized that they were able to get a guy like Cromer to bring physicality to the Bills run game, the Bills offense, the Bills offensive line, he was probably clapping for, for 24 hours straight. Um, so uh, let's get back to some of the clinic footage, though. Let's get back to Cromer talking about how important those hands are to offensive linemen, tight ends, and wide receivers here. If I'm the right tackle or right guard and I'm blocking down on this table, ball snap, bam. Ball snap, hand. Ball snap, get the hand on the defender. Why? Because he's not strong yet. Get your hands on him before he becomes the beast that he is. I absolutely love that. Same. Get your hand on the guy. Get your hand on the defensive lineman before he becomes the beast that he is. Like, what a freaking line by Cromer. This is, he's so relatable. And again, it's very simple. When the ball snap, hey, maybe you're uncovered. As an offensive lineman, there are times you're uncovered. Just get your hand out. Get your hand out, cover your gap. If something hits your hand, you're going to block it. If something doesn't, then you go find work. Like, that is a telling quote from him. Uh, listen to how that plays into actually some of the film footage here, too. Now, check out the right tackle. Ball snap, watch his hands. Ball snap, look at his left. Left, right. I mean, Cyrus Quanjo, guys. Cyrus <laughs> Quanjo. I mean, you guys you guys are Bills fans. You guys, that's all I got to say. You know what he I went love through how, as a tackle. I love how, like, Cromer just also just sounds like a stereotypical, like, old ball coach. Like, yeah. he just sounds bam. like a football guy. I love it. He's just like, watch his hand, bam, hit him. He just sounds, he just sounds like a football coach, and I love it. <laughs> no doubt about it. I mean, again, he coached up some really young guys and got them to play really well. Watch this technique from Cyrus Quanjo. Again, a guy that really didn't pan out as an NFL prospect, as an NFL player, and he got him to play really well, especially when we talk about technique. Left, right. Sit it down. Left, right. Look, look at his left hand on the guy's chest. Mm. You can see the white glove right there. It's white on, white on the guy's white jersey. Ball snap, hand. Hand. Now, this guy's really a wide four-eye reader, so he had to step even wider. He didn't even step with his inside foot, but it's a good illustration of hands. One, two. How physical was that? You talk about head out of the game. That's head out of the game, and guess what? And, and we're gaining yards. He made his block, and that's from a running back running this pin and pull from a gun position on the other side. So which is a long developing play. So you got to think about mm -hmm. it. Quarterback and the running back is are in a shotgun and he has the running back to the quarterback's left. So it's a long developing play for Cyrus Quanjo and for Miller uh, to get out onto the perimeter. Again, we love those pin and pull runs. We love the G pulls. I yes. hope to God they bring these back uh, more, even more than we saw late in the year, right, Anthony? <laughs> oh, for sure. We talked about it so much like Mitch Morse had how great he is at – two things, pop sets and pin and pulls and the success we saw Spencer Brown have and Ryan Bates, even Daryl Williams at times. It was just something mm -hmm. that gave the Bills an identity, worked really well with Devin Singletary and how this offense wanted to operate as a whole. And this clip is a really great example of how we talked about earlier of, you know, we, we talked about how Cromer and the Rams in 2018 through 2020 were so zone focused. But here's an example right here of him running pin and pulls and speaking to that gap scheme and to those specific pin and pulls that we're such fans of and that the Bills have been able to be successful with in 2021. So again, this is an example of how, you know, use Kendall's word there, the multiplicity of Aaron Cromer and how he's able to coach a variety of schemes in a variety of ways. You can trust that he's going to do what's best for the team based on the personnel that he has and how to maximize the unit as a whole and affect this offense. Mm -hmm. You can imagine if he was at home position, how easy it would have been. Is 
he's blocking the tackle. This is a tight end over. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't matter. He's blocking <laughs> down and he's pulling. So he's got this two technique. So watch him when the ball snaps. Watch. Hand. 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 Oh. That's not happening on accident. <laughs> when the ball snap, put your hand out. When the ball snap, get your hand on him. Get your hand on Because if he comes your way, he's not going to be expecting to have that 35-inch arm touching him. He's expecting to have a free run for a whole gap. So well, now watch what else he could do because he didn't get mired into the block. He didn't get mired. He didn't step down in and try to kill this two technique. He stepped at the hip. He blocked the shoulder. He got his hand on. And we pick up a T T uh, a oh. T nose stunt. Check it out. Look at that stunt pickup right there. Be and so what he's saying is uh, on the snap, yes. this guy's slanting inside. Linebacker's coming over top. It's a little stunt. And if Cordy Glenn had come down, you know, balls to the wall to hammer this guy, he would have gotten taken out of position mm -hmm. on the looper. On the, on the linebacker looping over the top. So, again, that hand placement, simple. Get your hand out and yeah. then just mm -hmm. watch the play develop, and this is what happens. Because because he was able to use his hands at the snap. But you follow what's happening. I mean, that's just <laughs> it's fun stuff, man. And like you said, hand. he is a hand. <laughs> hand. 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 <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people are going to start saying that now every time they watch this video and then get into the comments. Hand. Hand, hand. hand. <laughs> uh, but no, as I said, you know, his teachings and what he asks of his guys, they it really reverberates across the entire offense, not just the line. Uh, the Rams, as you guys know, they do have really good wide receiver blockers. They have some good tight ends that can block, as you saw in that uh, Green Bay cut up of Higby just taking out the linebacker. But obviously Cooper Cup, Bobby Woods, we know. Uh, are really good yep. blockers. And so the Rams, whether they're in 12 or 11 personnel and Cup and Woods are out there, like they have blockers everywhere, not just along yeah. the offensive line. So they use those guys, Kendall. And that way, as you're going to see Cooper Cup right here on the right side of the screen, watch him come across the formation and lead this play. And this is an interesting play from, again, he was a run game coordinator. So this is him mm -hmm, coordinating mm -hmm. this. This is really uh, it, it looks like a zone run to the uh, defense, but it's almost like a gap run because they're bringing that wide receiver across as almost like a puller. And you see him kick out that uh, edge defender there, the corner, and then the running back gets up the field for a nice run, Kendall. Just awesome schematics behind uh, yeah. this play. And not just the run blocking by the offensive line, but incorporating everyone to maximize the run game for the Rams. Yeah, and you think about how, you know, you just interchange Cooper Cup with maybe Gabe Davis, Ooh, and you could yeah. totally see this happening. It's, you know, you see this action from Cooper Cup, and you're thinking as a defense, oh, okay, cool, just, you know, your normal split flow, split zone uh, handoff here. But, no, you get the counter action from the running back, and it really does, like you said, turn into a power run, but it's a very creative yet simple power run, and that's what I keep coming back to with Cromer everything he's teaching and everything he's preaching just seems so simple and digestible from any player in the locker room. And that's why I'm so excited to see what he can do with guys like Spencer Brown, guys like Gabe Davis, who can then even evolve from what he is as a current blocker into mm -hmm. someone in a reduced set. Like we've seen in a reduced set as your quasi tight end. Yeah, and this is uh, Anthony. This is a good one too. So watch the the little combination at the block at the point of attack. But again, watch how they do it. But then again, you're getting cup across the formation, and of course, they always have the eye candy. That that's mm -hmm. what's awesome about the offense that the Rams run. And I think that's one of the wrinkles that maybe Cromer brings is you know mm -hmm. not just more jet action, but they ran some like with where you know it's jet action, but almost end arounds with pulling guards leading like. They did some really cool stuff. Again, throwback type football uh, with their wide receivers. Uh, hopefully, the Bills can you know find a guy to obviously hand it off to, like a McKenzie, if they don't bring him right. back. But maybe that's a wrinkle they bring in. But watch again the leverage by the two offensive linemen. I have diagrammed right here. You see this guy get the hand leverage. Here's the power coming downhill against that defensive tackle, and watch him just knock him out. I mean, that's it's just oh, so wow. easy. You know, the yeah. guard gets the hand leverage. Okay, he's just gonna hold on. He's going to get the work done and the, as a driver pushes him down. He, I mean, he's really just got to wait for that momentum and then just turn him. And, okay, now he's walled off. Here comes 
cup and then a wow. decent mm-hmm. run by the Rams, Anthony. I I really enjoy these plays from the Rams offense. And Eric, you you used this uh, term earlier when we were talking offline. Like what the Rams do so well and what they, they've done this year and what they did with Cromer, everything looks like everything. Like there's no like, oh, here comes this play. Like, cause they just do everything out of similar sets and similar yeah. formations. And they make, it can make a run look like a pass, a pass look like a run. They can make a gap run look like zone, so on and so forth. And the key for us here, you know, focusing on what Cromer does is again, we have another clip where you are seeing the same fundamentals that you've seen in the Bills offensive line yeah. in the previous clip with the Rams offensive line. Now you're seeing different players executing it at different spots. You're seeing a wide receiver like Cooper cup. Also, you know, credit to Cooper cup because you have to have the will and the effort level to want to block like this. And same thing for Bobby trees. Like you have to want to get it, but you're seeing wide receivers block with offensive line fundamentals and an offensive line mentality. And that comes from coaching that comes from an establishment of an identity on your offense. And you said it as the run game coordinator, right? He's instilling this in everyone. It's more than just the offensive line. It's the tight ends, the running backs, it's the wide receivers. And that was my last comment here that Jay Emming just said that run was against an eight man box too. When you have these types of fundamentals and you are able to, to work double teams efficiently to the point where you can establish leverage and get a push and then get a drive and still climb to a second or a third level. That's how you're able to run against heavier boxes because you're not out. You're not outgunned with defenders in the box because you can still afford to get a hat on a hat by creating double teams, climbing and scraping and scooping because of the fundamentals and what you have instilled. Yeah. It, it's, it's a beautiful thing that Cromer does when he coaches up the run game and the offensive line. Yeah, and here's um, a, a play that, uh, you know, I was doing some research today, obviously, on Cromer and, um, you know, how he coaches things up. And I uh, came across a podcast called Revealed, and it's really him sitting down with a host talking about uh, different portions of the season. It was actually right after this game. This was a week two game um, in 2020, and it was the week before they played the Bills. Yep. Um, so that was interesting. But also, um, he breaks down what he thought was his favorite play from this game. And this is it. And um, again, it, it really speaks to the old ball coach, right? You know, he picked the yeah. play where it wasn't his offensive linemen that were blocking. Well, it's mm-hmm. the wide receiver Cooper cup executing a technique, a hand technique to cut mm-hmm. off this backside defender, Brandon Graham. Again, this is think about it. This is Cooper cup. The probably, well, he's the best slot safety in maybe uh, slot say slot uh, wide receiver, but also probably one of the top receivers in the league. Mm-hmm. He is basically playing quasi tight end here and cutting off the backside defensive end here against the Eagles. And so I sliced up the film and I put it to the audio. So you're going to hear him talking about this play uh, being his favorite play um, against the Eagles. Again, week two of the 2020 season. When you can ask a wide receiver to use a technique that you're looking for um, to be able to cut off a defensive end that has been beating tight ends and tackles, you know, all day. And he he takes the guy's hand away. You watch Cooper Cup on that play at the end of the game. He he knocks the guy, knocks Graham's hand down and then gets his hand back underneath and cuts the guy off. And we and, and uh, Daryl Henderson just scoots right through that backside gap. And it's wide open. And, and, you know, when you get something like that from a wide receiver against their best player, one of their best players, I mean, you, you can't ask for more than that. I mean, Kendall, like, <laughs> dude, this is, I mean, it doesn't look like much. Like when you're watching the game, no, you're probably not. not even noticing that. But watch Brandon Graham. He's trying to get his hands out, obviously control uh, the wide receiver there. And it's just simple, chop and rip. And that's ju- that's enough. That's enough, especially with the speed coming north and south from mm-hmm. the running back to get upfield. And he was talking about this. This was with, like, Five minutes left in the game, um, and it was obviously an end-of-the-game type scenario. Well, hey, the offense wants to run the ball out, run the clock out. I mean, simple but well-coached, and mm-hmm. we're not just talking offensive line. And this is what excites me. He's going to get Rob Boris to start teaching some of these techniques. He's going to get Chad Hall teaching mm-hmm. these uh, techniques to the wide receivers. Mm-hmm. Right, Kendall? Yeah, that's what's so exciting because it does add so much to the running game, like like Ant just said, that everything looks like everything. That's what makes it so effective because you can line up guys like like Gabe Davis in that quasi-tight end role. Mm-hmm. And if he knows how to do this stuff fundamentally with his hands and just 
get in the right place at the right time, it creates a big run. And it, it seems like it's so complex, but you look at it and you're just like, okay, he's, he's lined up against Brandon Graham. This, this doesn't look like it's going to go so well, but if you got the proper technique and you get the proper jump off the snap, you can see what can happen of this play. Everyone on the front side is doing their job, but then obviously Cooper cup with that <laughs> chop, like you said, and working through it, it, it really is spectacular. Anthony, wrap up this segment, wrap up this play, brother. We talked about it, right? You, you, We talked about it earlier. You guys both mentioned it on this play. Cromer said it. What does Cooper Cup do? The first thing that he does when he hands. blocks Brandon, the hands, hand, hand, hand. <laughs> you are instilling a fundamental technique into your players that they use like it's second nature. Yep. And when you take that and have – an entire grouping using those techniques and those fundamentals. They are understanding the whys behind what they are doing. They are executing it the way it's intended to be done. And that's how you get effectiveness and sustainability in your team. That's the most exciting thing we have seen now clip after clip, different years of the Rams, different teams in the Rams versus the bills, but you are seeing the same techniques. You are seeing the same fundamentals. And not only does that speak to the players, but again, that speaks to Cromer for two things. One, mm -hmm. because he has a system and a scheme that can work with a variety of players, but it also speaks to his ability to get different players to buy into what he's teaching. He's yeah. able to explain it to them and get them to buy in and understand what he's talking about because you've got guys, again, different teams, different players, different position groupings, all acting in unison, all with different skill sets, different mentalities, different body types, all that stuff, but they're all operating on the same plane. And that's because Coach Cromer gets their buy-in. He's able to coach them up, teach them, explain them the whys, and they go out and they execute. And that's a beautiful thing. Like, that is a tremendous thing. You have to get the buy-in from your players and be able to get them to execute what you're trying to teach. You have to set your players up for success, and there has to be that relationship, that rapport between coach and player. It's like teacher and student. Cromer has done that everywhere he's gone. It's huge. Yeah, and to wrap up the, the Cromer segment in this film room, uh, I just want to, again, talk about maybe – uh, the impact, obviously, aside from the technique, the fabulous technique that he teaches, but maybe, um, you know, personnel wise and maybe a shift uh, in, in what they do. I said at the top with Dorsey, I noticed a little more 12 personnel when he was a QB coach in Carolina. I noticed the physicality. Well, it kind of showed up in Cromer's film when he showed up in L.A. as well. Uh, they started mm -hmm. switching their personnel uh, uh -huh. to more 12 personnel. So I'm going to read this quote at the top. Uh, this is from Cromer. Uh, in, an, in an article that he did uh, that they wrote on him a few years ago. So the first year in L.A., uh, just establishing what we wanted to do and how we were going to get it done, because on first and second down, there are a lot of defenses that want to try to stop any chance you have of running the ball and gaining yards. It, it and he's referring to 11 personnel, changes a lot of the running game and how you go about attacking defenses. And this is mm -hmm. important from a Bills perspective, because the Bills primarily have been an 11 personnel team just like the Rams were in 2018, as you can see on the screen. So overall personnel grouping uh, in 2018, uh, you can see they didn't use 12 personnel all that much. It was heavy 11 personnel. They only used uh, 12 personnel 8% of the time, which was ranked 31st. And on base downs, on base offense downs, first and second down, the right column, you can see it, it was only 9%, and that was 31st. And coincidentally enough, I swear to you, these are the <laughs> same exact percentages that the Bills used in 2021. I swear to God, go check it. Sharp football <laughs> stats. Like it was eerie. Okay. So his first year uh, in LA, you see that heavy 11 personnel, not many multiple tight end sets, just like the bills bills use Knox and sometimes Gilliam towards the end of the year, they use him a little mm -hmm. more, um, mm -hmm. but they use Gabriel Davis is that quasi type tight end tight end. I mean, so it makes you wonder like, are the bills going to make this type of shift and try to go to more like a power spread team with Josh Allen, uh, sort of like how they did uh, with Cam Newton back in 2015 in those years. Uh, because you can see in 2019, they went from 8% in 2018 to 21% 12 personnel in 2019. And then in 2020, they were running 29%, which was the third. So they went from 31st to 11th to third overall 12 personnel in those years and in base offense. So those downs that he's talking about where a lot of defenses want to shut down your run game, get you in a third and long, 
he went from 9% in 2018, 25% in 2019, which was ranked 12th, and then finally 35% of the time on first and second down, the Rams were having 12 personnel on the field, which was the third most. So quite the telling stats here, Anthony. So I want to get your thoughts on maybe the possibility of you know shifting to 12 personnel. Obviously, uh, maybe Gilliam plays that second tight end role, but either way, with free agency around the corner, I think, you know, you guys need to start looking at some tight ends to bring in to kind of compete because it seems like maybe Cromer and I think McDermott in the end wants this brand of football for his bills. Yeah, I think with what Cromer has shown in the past year with these numbers combined with what the Carolina Panthers did in their time with Ken Dorsey and Cam Newton combined with what Joe Brady likes to do with his tight ends and just his overall philosophy of making defenses have to defend every blade of grass. I think it speaks to their ability to use more personnel groupings than just 11 and 10 personnel in 2022. Again, it's the idea of being multiple and being varied and, you know, running 12 personnel so that you can actually run the ball, but running 12 personnel and making it look like a run and then having actually, it actually be a pass and throwing defenses off. I would expect to see more personnel variation from the bills in 2022. And I know the, you know, the bills like Tommy Sweeney, but yeah, maybe the bills bring in a tight end who can execute both sides of the run in the pass. Like we, like the bills potentially want from all three of these new guys that we've talked about here tonight. I would expect to see more, personnel variation and I would expect to see more of that on first and second down not just from these numbers but because of how we saw teams defend the mm. Buffalo Bills last year we saw teams say okay cool here's a light box here's two high safeties go ahead and run the ball because we're going to defend pass and we don't think you either a run the ball or b you'll run it effectively I don't think defenses are going to be able to do that this year. I think the Bills are going to come in with a different mentality and a different mindset based on how 2021 ended combined with these new coaches. I think you see more personnel variation in order to keep defenses honest and take advantage of mismatches and potential opportunities like that. Kendall, what are your thoughts on adding a little more 12 personnel? Again, a conversation we've had uh, you know, over the last year, year and a half. Uh, it's something that you know a lot of us wanted to, again, add that different dynamic to the Bills offense and uh, – Obviously, we didn't get it last year, this past season, but uh, maybe going forward, again, maybe it doesn't happen this year. Maybe it's it's in transition this year, kind of like right. you see uh, on the on the screen. But what are your thoughts on adding that that element? And and really, and what it really does is add that physicality element, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. It would add the physicality. It would add the the element of surprise, kind of like Ant was saying. Uh, and like you said, I mean, I was hoping for this last year. This is something I thought we were going to do last year and last off season. We we're going to transition into more of a multiple offense because obviously once you put an offensive season like 2020 together on tape, everyone's going to study it. Everyone's going to try their best to take what you do best away. So you kind of have to adapt. And I figured, you know, a little bit more 12 personnel was a way to adapt. And, you know, maybe we're a year late on it, but better late than never. I'm, I'm expecting probably a free agent acquisition or a mid to late round draft pick at tight mm -hmm. end. I, I think they would like to keep Gilliam as a primary fullback. That's just kind of my gut. Obviously he has the ability to play tight end too. Uh, but I, I think he's best in that, in that Hughes check role, the, the baby Hughes check role. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I think we have the roster where it's really just, can we get that depth, that tight end too? So people can be afraid of maybe we're going to run or pass out of 12 personnel because yeah, like Anthony said, I mean, being able to run an offense and really not tip your hand at all to the defense mm. goes such a long way. And yeah, just seeing those two high safeties and that the, the top uh, quote on that graphic, they're really saying how it's so different running out of 11 personnel versus 12 personnel it works perfectly into what we're assuming sean mcdermott sean mcdermott's uh preferred brand of football is which is physicality so that'll bring that mm -hmm. and hopefully some multiplicity to the offense yeah again the bills don't have cooper cup and woods blocking for them at wide receiver no. I, honestly that's been one of the issues the last few years running this uh offense is uh, you know, they had those smaller receivers that could separate, but they weren't good blockers. You know, some of them are willing more than mm -hmm. others, but 
Um, you don't have guys like that when you only have two re- or three receiver sets and that can block like those guys. So uh, there's a couple questions that are coming in. Uh, one of them from Jay Emming here. He's, he's hoping that maybe Cromer will be able to resurrect Ford's career. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I mentioned um, in our notes about, you know, Ford um, Bates, if he comes back even more this mm-hmm. late in his career, like ways to maximize their skill sets. And I do think mm-hmm. as you guys saw, like the different teachings of, you know, strong base, just getting your hand on someone using your got your tackles to be the drivers like Dawkins mm-hmm. and Brown. Maybe that can salvage uh, Ford's career in, in, in some ways. Bates, I, I swear if they I hope they bring him back because, yeah, Bates under Cromer with how well he is with his technique already, mm-hmm. his his game could go to a whole nother, another level. Right, Anthony? I mean, that type of development would be nice. Uh, from the offensive line. So one of the questions that I had prior to this, Ant, I'll give this, I'll throw this one to you, um, was about the game plan and, and Dorsey. And, you know, mm-hmm. Dable always talked about um, having a different game plan each and every week. It's a Patriot, w- Patriot way, all that jazz. Um, do you think Dorsey <laughs> will approach it the same way? Do you think he will uh, want a different game plan uh, each and every week or have more of an identity going into each game? I think there, I think it'll like anything. I think there's bits and pieces of everything. I think we'll have a bill's identity overall for this offense, but I would expect to see different game planning based on matchup. Like we have seen, like, honestly, like we saw um, a bit in Carolina, but like what we saw the last couple of years from Brian Dable and this bill's offense. And when you have a, when you have a quarterback like Josh Allen and the potential versatility of that combined with a run game, I would expect to see that. I think that's the best recipe for success, being able to match at each and every week, again, based off of your identity and knowing who you are. But I would expect to see, yeah, different modes of attack, much like what we saw last year, where it was like, okay, this week we're going to go under center a little bit more. Okay, you know what? Next week we're going to go more pin and pull runs and we're going to run it early. You know what? Nope. We're going to start out with passes and RPOs and this type of game script to start things off. So I expect to see um variability in this bill's offense with the central theme and identity but i think they will attack opponents differently based on each week um use that patriots game um in week 16 and in the playoffs is the perfect example more isaiah mckenzie because of single high coverages and man coverages use those deep overs as opposed to more cole beasley against the miami dolphins uh on halloween or against the kansas city chiefs in the playoffs based on matchup attacking defenses differently and attacking their weaknesses all right, Kendall, this one's for you. Uh, the Trek reviewer asks, with Tom Brady retiring and the fact that we need a second tight end and that the Bills almost got him last year, could we see Gronk come to Buffalo as tight end too? I've already put this out there on Twitter and <laughs> everyone's giving me shit for it. I mean, like, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> like, why? Like, why wouldn't we want Gronk to come back to Buffalo? I understand the whole Patriots, it's the whole face. concussion to Trey White, like, I understand that, but at the end of the day, if the locker room can get behind it, why should we care as fans? You know, why should we yeah. care to to gatekeep this locker room from something that's really because he hurt our room? baby boy? He gave yeah. his baby quite a concussion. What if the baby our boy says it's okay though? That that's kind of where I stand <laughs> yeah. on it. It's like honestly, I really feel like it comes down to Trey White. Like if if Trey White and him <laughs> can figure him. it out, like if they can hash it out then I have absolutely no problem with it. The stage of where he is in his career, I think it plays perfectly to where Knox is in his career and what we need as a tight end to in this offense because we know how physical he is as a blocker, but also how physical he is with the ball in his hands and how how strong of hands he has as a pass catcher. So obviously, yeah, there's the wear and tear, there's the injury risk, all of that stuff, and obviously the Trey White stuff, but... If he's willing to and it's at a decent cost, there's no reason we should take that off the table. I think it plays perfectly into where the roster currently stands and working into that tight end two argument. Give yeah, me Tyler Conklin you know, from Minnesota. He never hurt Trey White. That's obviously. another <laughs> one, though. I'm very interested in Tyler Conklin. Yeah, we're going to get to some of the free agents. Don't worry. We'll have shows that we'll be able to break down some film on uh, tight ends and every other position. But um, I like your point, man. You do have a good point. And, you know, as Anthony said, um, you know, do you want to play a too high shell with two tight ends being in Knox and Gronk in there? I mean, cause then good they're luck. just going to pound their <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you bring, you go into single high looks, you load the box. Good luck. So have fun. yes, I'm all for bringing weapons in. If the, the coaches, the front office and the players can get past it, I don't care. Like bring them exactly. in. Exactly. Bring them in. 
Um, with that said, let's let's wrap it up. We've had a bunch of people here for uh, you know a good hour and a half. Uh, it was a fun show, guys. This was a little different, having some of the clinic mm-hmm. stuff and then tying it into some of the schemes and the coaching experiences over the last few years. Um, fun, fun show. So, Kendall, I'll start with you, man. Let everyone know where they can follow you on social media and uh, what else you have going on this week. So you can follow me at Mursky Kendall on Twitter for, you know, my ramblings of what I'm not okay with happening on Bills Mafia Twitter. And then obviously just the stuff I'm I'm hoping the Bills listen to this offseason. Uh, it doesn't always go my way. But you'll see me a lot on the Air Raid Hour with my guys Judge and Tilt breaking down a lot of draft stuff. And then obviously uh, here on the film room breaking down whatever we have next. Uh, yeah, it's been awesome being in the film room with you guys, learning a lot of stuff every week. And uh, yeah, glad to be a part of it. The workhorse, what you got going on this week. I know you got a show tomorrow, but what else? Oh, hey, that's me on the workhorse. Uh, find me on Twitter <laughs> at pro underscore underscore ant. That's pro two underscores A N T. I got disguise coverage, my weekly show live at 7 p.m. every Wednesday, live on YouTube. Tomorrow's episode, myself and Mr. Russell Brown, our draft guru at cover mm-hmm. one. We're going to be going over the 2022 cornerback class, the class overall, the top of the class, number one corners, sleepers, fits for the Bills, all that stuff. So I know Bills Mafia is very much interested in a potential cornerback upgrade this offseason and looking towards the draft, much like they were last year. So tune into that tomorrow night live at 7. And then we, as a brand, we've got a little cover one extravaganza coming your way this Friday. We're going to be doing a bit of a free agency extravaganza in terms of looking at free agents that are, you know, up for contract on the bills and talking about extending trading, releasing, bringing back all that kind of stuff. It'll be a cover one super show extravaganza live this Friday. Do not miss that. And then, yeah, find me here on the film room every single week. And um, I'm a Gemini and I like, Long moonlit walks on the beach, <laughs> beach. <and> strawberry daiquiris, <laughs> and uh, that's me. <laughs> and film, of course. And of uh, course uh, film. Yeah, and guys, thanks for tuning in. I, we couldn't do this without you. Every resource that you saw here, the stats, the graphics, um, our, our, you know, my cameras we're using, iPads, everything yeah. you see, huddle, uh, the clinic footage, everything is is able to be done because of you guys, your support. Um, and you know, we appreciate you guys tuning in each and every week. And, uh, again, if you're not a subscriber, uh, subscribe to the cover one YouTube channel. We have shows every day, smash the like button, leave a comment, tell your friends, tell your family about our show. Um, there aren't many shows that do film breakdowns like us, and especially that go an hour and a half, sometimes two hours breaking down prospects, but we love it. We love doing it for you. We love teaching. We love, you know, everything about this. So thanks for tuning in. So on behalf of Anthony and Kendall, I'm Eric. We'll see you next week.